Well, we are, um, we are very lucky to have uh, Jan and Ed Katinsky as a part of our church family and so blessed uh, to be partnering with them in what they are doing overseas. So I, I do hope that you continue to pray for them and think about uh, how you can be a part of that. Um, if you are at all a fan of college basketball, you know that we are in the middle of March Madness. Now, if you are unfamiliar, as I was for a very long time with the idea of March Madness, what March Madness is, is an opportunity for college basketball fans to come and predict which of the 64 teams involved in the tournament will be winners and which ones will be losers. Uh, and you will fill out a bracket of all these different teams. Can you tell that I'm not a basketball fan even as I describe this? I sound like a, a university professor trying to describe <laughs> a sports tournament. But uh, you come along, you try and predict these teams, and as you might guess from the name of the tournament, March Madness, people get a little crazy about how they pick their teams. You have got people who are researching it deeply, looking through all of the statistics to try and find the most likely team to make it through. You have got people who will take copious notes throughout the season so they can try and guess it. You have even got people who go to the lengths of devising computer programs to try and calculate probability and pick their teams for them. It is madness. But what is most mad is the likelihood that you are actually going to get winners. Warren Buffett said that if anyone can actually get a perfect March Madness bracket, he will pay them $1 million per year for life. So that's a, that's a very generous offer by Mr. Buffett. But the reason why Mr. Buffett does that is because the odds of winning a perfect bracket, of getting every single team's victory or loss correct, is one in 9.2 quintillion. To put that into perspective for you guys, you are more likely to get hit by lightning three times in a single year. You are more likely to guess a nine-character computer password on the first try. You are more likely to get eight half-court shots in a basketball game in a row than you are to get a perfect March Madness bracket. The chances of accurately predicting this are unbelievable, astounding. Yet every Sunday morning, we come to church and we read from a book that has accurately predicted the details of a man's life who lived hundreds of years after the predictions were written. And we look at the book of Isaiah this morning about an account that goes into some very, very unique details about the life of the Messiah, about the life of Jesus. And Isaiah, living hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, accurately predicts details about who Jesus is. This is a chapter that is recounted in the New Testament more than most. And the reason for that being is because the things that it says about the Messiah are incredibly accurate. Astounding that Isaiah could, through the Spirit of God, foresee what was coming. And that is, in essence, what this whole series is really about. We are looking at the prophets in the Old Testament in the Old Testament, and seeing how they foresaw and predicted the coming of Jesus. We're looking at the things that they said about him, the way that God revealed himself long before Jesus showed up. And we've heard about a king that we need, a king that can be truly good. We've heard about a lover that we need who can be truly faithful to us, even in the face of our unfaithfulness. We have heard about how we need an advocate who can defend us before a holy God. And we have heard about a light that can shine in our darkness. But this morning as we read Isaiah 53, we come to one of the most shocking and one of the most graphic prophecies about the Messiah. We come to the suffering servant. You see, this Messiah that we have been reading about, this one who is to come, who is to be our king and our advocate and our faithful lover and our light in the darkness will also have to be despised and rejected. He will have to be pierced and crushed and he will ultimately be living and reigning. So let's read this text together. We're in Isaiah 53 this morning. Let me read through this together. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look to him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shearers silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. The first thing that we hear about this Messiah who is to come is that he will be despised and rejected. He will be despised and rejected. There is a popular TV show that is uh, both in America and in the UK. Over here it's called American Idol. Uh, and in England we call it Pop Idol because we're not quite as patriotic. Um, and this show, I'm sure many of you know, the aim of the show is to come on to sing before a panel of judges, and if you are good enough, you will be taken to the next stage and perhaps get a record deal, perform at famous locations. Uh, many, many people come to perform. But one year in England, uh, there was a woman who appeared on the show called Susan Boyle. This is a picture of Susan. Now, Susan uh, does not look like the kind of person you would expect to win a singing competition. Uh, Susan is a very nice lady, she's a very kind lady, but no one predicted that this person was going to go very far in the competition at all. In fact, when she came on stage, many of the people in the audience started sniggering and laughing because with one look, they looked at Susan and decided this woman is not a singer. Without even hearing a note, without hearing anything else, they decided this is not the winner. But then this happened. What are you going to sing tonight? I'm going to sing I Dreamed a Dream from the Miserables. Okay. Big song. <laughs> yeah? Yes. I dreamed a dream in time gone by. That's what people from where I come from talk like. See, I'm much better than they are. Um, but no one expected Susan to be what she turned out to be. One of the most beautiful singers that came on the show and went to the very final. Now a multi-record selling artist in England. Isaiah tells us the story in chapter 53 about a Messiah that none of us would expect. Someone who is despised and rejected. Someone who does not fit our picture of what a rescuer should look like. He begins by saying, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. And no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. Isaiah's message is one about a Messiah who is weak and who is vulnerable. A message about someone who does not have the outward appearance of a rescuer 
or a king or a warrior or anyone that we should desire. He actually paints a picture of a servant who is in some ways the antithesis of what we would expect God's rescuer to look like. He begins by asking the question again, who has believed what he has heard from us? The reason why Isaiah asks that is because the message to some is unbelievable. He says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now in scripture, the arm of the Lord is a phrase most often used to describe God's saving power. That Yahweh's saving power, the arm of the Lord, that's what comes to rescue Israel. And the arm of the Lord in this account is described as a young plant, not a mighty oak, not a great redwood, but a young sapling on dry ground, vulnerable, could be extinguished, could be crushed, could be easily destroyed. Now this doesn't sound like the arm of the Lord. And this is the reason why many Jewish people struggled with what is being said here in Isaiah 53, and then thinking that about the Messiah. This doesn't look like a person who's victorious, who can rescue us. And therein is the lesson for us. God doesn't always work the way that we expect Him to. God doesn't show up in our lives the way that sometimes we want Him to. The Israelites were awaiting someone, not who would suffer for them, not one who would be weak for them, but who would cause their enemies to suffer, who would expose their enemies' weaknesses. So why does God reveal his power through someone like this? Why would God send someone so weak, someone so easily despised? Well, if we jump to Isaiah 55, Isaiah tells us. This is what God speaks through him. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. It is easier to miss God than we would like it to be. It's easier for us to miss God's grace and what God's doing in our life than we would like it to be sometimes. Because God doesn't look the way that we want him to. God doesn't show up the way that we want him to sometimes. Just like the best March Madness brackets, you have to be prepared for some upset. You have to be prepared that things are not going to go the way that you anticipate they will. The Messiah might not look like the kind of person that you want. The Messiah, the rescuer, may not look like the kind of person who can deal with the things that you think need to be dealt with. But my encouragement to you is that though God doesn't always deliver what we expect or what we want, He always delivers what we need. If you are searching in your life right now for the place that God is at work, I want to encourage you, He is there. He is there amidst the pain, amidst the questions, amidst the struggle. He may not look like what you want Him to look like. The way that He shows up may not be the way that you want Him to show up, but He is there. He is there in the weakness. He is there in the struggle because God doesn't give us what we want. He gives us what we need. What we needed was not a conquering king that would put our enemies to shame. What we needed was a suffering servant who would be pierced and crushed. That's what we needed, someone who would be pierced and crushed. When I was in college, and a little less responsible than I am now, uh, I got one or two speeding tickets. I'm ashamed to admit it, but we all get them. And on this particular occasion, I was very, very upset because uh, I had been caught when I was running between errands and I was rushing around. And it wasn't a particularly uh, dramatic over the speed limit uh, incident, but my ticket was $220. Now, to paint you a picture of how likely it was that I would be able to pay this, I was living off hot dogs without the buns because I had no money at all. I was not living at all in the way that suggests I could pay off a fine like that. So I went home devastated that I have this fine that I have to pay. And as I get home, I run into one of my best friends. Comes out, asks me what's wrong, and I explain 
what's going on. And my friend who loves me, whose birthday it was, says, I just got $220 for my birthday. Here you go. I want you to take this to pay off your speeding ticket. Now, I was completely flawed by that. But what I want you to notice in that is that my friend who loved me didn't say, well, just ignore it. You didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. Don't worry about it. My friend still, in order to love me, had to pay something. Because in my life, I had a penalty hanging over my head, and as much as I would want it to go away, it had to be paid. It had to be dealt with. And even someone loving me, giving me grace, had to pay it for me. Because there was only two options in that scenario. Either I pay it, or someone else pays it for me. It's not going to go away any other way. That is why we need the suffering servant. It's because Isaiah tells us there is a penalty over our heads that must be dealt with. And that's what the Messiah comes to deal with. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I want you to think about this for a moment, this idea of having to pay a penalty because no forgiveness can come without price. No rescue that God effects in our life can come without a price. Imagine with me if we were having dinner together and I, being a terrible guest, accidentally break one of your treasured family heirlooms, shatters all over the ground. Now in that moment, there are two things that can happen. Either you can hold me accountable for having damaged it, for having broken it. You can pin on me the cost of having it repaired or restored or replaced. Or you can forgive me. And if you forgive me, then you are taking on yourself the cost of repairing it, the cost of replacing it, the emotional cost even of getting past what has been destroyed. But in no scenario can you simply forgive me and we walk away without someone paying for it, otherwise the broken heirloom remains on the ground and nothing is set right. If what the point of God's Messiah is, is to set right what is broken, he is going to have to pay a price. Either we pay the price or he does. And that is what Jesus came to do. That is what the Messiah came to do. Now, I want to understand this morning the importance of this because we are just a few weeks away from Holy Week, the week in the year where we commemorate the suffering of Jesus and what he went through. And Jesus' price that he paid was immeasurably great. It was a steep price. First of all, Jesus paid for us an emotional price. The Messiah paid for us an emotional price. We are told that he carried our grief and our sorrows. In Jesus' lifetime, he was rejected and despised by many. That's why he ended up on a cross. And he placed himself as our Messiah to great emotional cost. On the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is Jesus, the Son of God, who from eternity past had dwelt in perfect unity with his Father, the most perfect and beautiful relationship that there ever was, and at the cross, he separated from him. Imagine the person you love most, that you treasure most, that brings you the most comfort and security being ripped from you in a moment. That's what Jesus felt on the cross. The Father that he loved separated from him. The Father, the Son that he loved and treasured being torn from him. That is an immeasurable emotional cost. But he didn't just pay an emotional cost, he paid a physical cost. Jesus was quite literally pierced by something that looked like this. This is the kind of nail that would be used by Roman soldiers to crucify their victims. A lot different than what we typically think of when we think of nails. 
a spike that is thick that would be driven between one of the most sensitive areas of your body on your wrist. It was put through his wrists and his feet. But Jesus wasn't simply crucified. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was whipped. He was scourged. He was spat upon. Jesus suffered horrendous physical pain at the cross. Our Messiah was truly pierced for our transgressions. But all this pales in comparison to the steepest price that Jesus had to pay. The spiritual price that he paid for us. You see, many of us look to the cross and we see the wounds and the bleeding and we say, wow, Jesus, that is an amazing price that you paid for us. But we neglect to notice what is happening behind all of that. You see, Jesus didn't simply have to pay a physical and emotional price. He had to face the true penalty of our sin, which was the wrath of God. Jesus had to face that. Because God is so loving, so perfectly good, so perfectly holy, that God cannot look on sin and human evil and not be angry about it, not bring retribution against it. God is so good that he must punish evil. It's part of who God is. And so in order to rescue us, Jesus had to face that wrath. Now to try and paint a picture of what that wrath is like, because it's very difficult to understand it, one preacher put it this way. Imagine a dam that was 10,000 miles high and 10,000 miles wide, filled to the brim with water. The largest body of water that you can imagine. Gallons upon gallons upon gallons upon gallons. And that dam breaks. And in a moment, the full weight of that water comes rushing towards you. Gushing, frothing, foaming as you see it hurtling towards you. And right before it hits you, the ground in front of you breaks open and swallows every last drop of the water that was coming for you. That crack in the ground, that chasm that swallows that water is Jesus. He is the one who at the cross was broken open for us so that he could swallow the wrath of God. So that he could erase and remove the guilt on our lives. That is a price that none of us can ever truly fathom. It is why we celebrate and remember every year what Jesus did. Because the price that he paid was immeasurable. Now what does that mean for us? What does it mean for us that Jesus has paid this price? The first thing that it means is that any guilt on your life has been 100% erased if you are in Christ Jesus. Jesus has paid a very real price for your forgiveness. There is none of us who are in Christ that should ever fear that we need to do anything to win God's affection or approval because of the price that has been paid. It is more than any of us can imagine. God has been given more than any of us could ever give him for our sin by Jesus. And so every Sunday we should sit in these pews celebrating that when God looks at us, he does not see our sin. He sees Christ's righteousness. He sees a son or daughter who is without guilt. You do not need to be in here ashamed, worrying whether God saw what you did on Tuesday this week, whether God saw what you thought on Wednesday this week, whether he sees the way that you treat people when you're outside of these walls, because when you come in here, you remember the fact that Jesus has erased that by paying a steep price, by giving himself, allowing himself to be crushed, to be beaten, to be wounded. It also means that our God put himself into our shoes to feel something absolutely horrendous. Something real. So that when you go through your trials and your struggles, you are not praying to a God who does not know what it's like to suffer. Who doesn't know what it's like to have an emotional burden crushing you. When you pray, you are not speaking with a God who doesn't know what it's like to go through physical agony. When you pray to God, you are not speaking with a God who doesn't know what it's like to feel 
spiritual separation, to feel apart from God, to feel as though you cannot see him. Jesus has embraced all of that so that when you speak to him, he can know what that's like. Jesus, more than anyone else in this world, knows what it's like to be like you, to go through the things that you have been through. And he subjected himself to that for our sake. And now we come to the best news of all in Isaiah 53, that the Messiah is not only one who suffers, not only one who is pierced and despised, but one who is living and reigning. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. And the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. The suffering servant story may involve some unimaginable tragedy, pain and suffering. But ultimately, the end of this servant story, the end of Jesus' story, is one of hope for us. We should be excited, we should rejoice, we should celebrate even this tragedy because because of this tragedy, we have been set free. We have been set free. Isaiah gives us a couple of reasons to take comfort from this prophecy. He says, first of all, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. It was the will of the Lord not the will of the Romans, not the will of the Sanhedrin or the Jewish authorities, not the will even of Satan, but the will of the Lord to crush him. That's a hard verse to read and to understand. And that's not even the most difficult translation. Some translations will actually save this verse in verse 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, to crush him. It pleased him. What could that mean? What could motivate God the Father to so desire his son's chastisement? What could cause the Father to plan the cross? For God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What motivated God to plan this? Why is it the will of the Lord to crush Jesus? Because God loves us. Because God's devotion to us is unimaginable. What motivates him, what pleases him, is not the particulars of his son's suffering, but what his son's suffering will produce, which is our rescue our redemption, our separation from everything that plagues us and ails us. By his wounds, we will be healed. His chastisement will bring us peace. Something of infinite good and worth is going to be created by this son's suffering, by this servant's suffering. For God so loved, God so loved you and I that it was worth it to send his son, to give us his son, Paul Tripp, one of my favorite Christian teachers, said God looked at the horror and the brokenness and the pain of this world and was so flooded by compassion and by grace and by love and mercy that he was not willing that we would stay in that place, that we would stay in that condition. God was willing to give what was most precious to him, what was most treasured to him to rescue us from that condition. That's our first reason to take comfort, is that God has intentioned this for good. Secondly, Isaiah hints that this suffering of the seven is not going to be the end of the story. This is not where it's going to end in suffering and agony and anguish. He says in verse 11, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. The NIV translates that differently again. It says that he has suffered and he will see the light of life. I think Isaiah is pointing us towards the resurrection. That after suffering, after going through all of this pain, the Messiah will rise. And he's going to see the fruits of his labor. He's going to see what his suffering has bought. He's telling us that death is not going to be the end. All of our sin, all of our sorrow, it wasn't enough 
to end Jesus. Can I encourage you with something this morning? Because if you're anything like me, you can sit in church and you can hear the Bible and you can think, yeah, but God doesn't know about this. This detail of my life, this one little part of me, Jesus can forgive this guy, but he can't forgive me. He can't forgive me. What is in me is too black, it's too dark, it's too messed up, it's too broken. He can't redeem me. But God's love will always overcome what is darkest in your life. God's light will always shine brighter than the darkest part of any of our hearts. That is why the sun will see the light of life is because his life was worth infinitely more than all of the mistakes and brokenness that we had brought. There is so much hope to take from this. And I want you to see the beauty of the sacrifice that Christ has made. I want you to see, as Paul says in the New Testament, that he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all? all things. That is the God who has sent this Messiah. The God who has given us his very best, who has given us more than we deserve, more than we could ask for, more than we could hope for. He has given us his son. Jesus said that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The joy set before him. You are that joy. You are the joy that because you were set before Jesus, he was willing to go through this. A Christian, more than anybody else, has less reason to ever fear God because God was willing to give us what was best, what was most precious to him. You never need to fear that you are alone in your struggles and that God will withhold from you anything that you need. So this morning, what our experience of this passage comes down to is this. Do we believe it? Do you believe this? That's what Isaiah asks us at the beginning. He says, who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That is Isaiah's call to action for Israel at the time of its writing. And I think it's his call to action for us this morning. Do we believe that God has not spared his own son for our sake? Do we believe that God was willing to give Christ over to this suffering so that we could be rescued, so that we could know peace? Do we believe that the arm of the Lord is best revealed in the lamb led to the slaughter, the one hung on the cross for our guilt, the suffering servant and the risen Christ? Would you pray with me as we close this morning? Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the tremendous hope and joy that comes from reading about this suffering servant. You paid an immeasurable price. You endured unimaginable suffering. And God, you did that for us. Lord, I am the chief of sinners and the least worthy of that in this room, but yet you gave your only son And if you give your only son, what else could you ever withhold from me and from us? We rejoice and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.